Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe pictured here asking if he can pet a dog that he saw in the audience. He's giving a very detailed outline of how he's going to pet that dog. Anyways, he is excited to announce that he has rolled out the new Saskatchewan budget. And since it's an election year budget, money for everyone! Not enough, obviously, and incredibly rosy financial projections. Basically an entire budget that's just smoke and mirrors. Now of course, as almost every year, they insist they're running a short-term budget, but all of a sudden things are going to be massive surpluses in the near future. Although, dose of skepticism probably required here, as their last budget was $1.3 billion off with projections. Although that's not entirely true, because they added another three quarters of a billion dollars of spending last month. So really they were off by two billy. They're good at math, you see. Now, the budget includes almost entirely previously announced funding. Things like free money for SARM, money for classrooms, that's definitely not a mirage, and money for healthcare. However, a couple of notable trends emerge. Number one, almost all of the spending is on buildings. Like they're building nine schools next year. Who's gonna work there? They're building a bunch of healthcare facilities. Who's gonna work there? They'll spend money on everything except staffing as they continue to grow the debt. But I wanna really highlight these two charts. First up, education spending. This is how much they've spent on supports for learning as a percentage of total education funding. It's down to 14%, the largest single year drop in over a decade. But what I wanna really highlight is how the Saskatchewan government lies to you in election budgets. So the blue lines here are what they spend in election budgets. The red lines are what they spend the following year. As you can see, the good Scott Moe giveth and the Scott Moe taketh away. He taketh away almost immediately after you voteth for him. And this is the issue. This is incredibly obvious vote buying. That's why all of this money has eject clauses where they can stop spending it if the mood takes them. But there's another layer here because the budget's even worse than it looks were it not for the amount of money that they're taking from you. Because despite the amount that the government claims that they hate carbon taxes and carbon pricing, their newly implemented output-based performance standards brought almost a half a billion dollars into the budget. Without that, the deficit's even bigger. So they'll complain about carbon pricing, but not when they get to keep the money. They like it then. But I think it's really telling that a budget that brings forward major investments in healthcare and education isn't believed at all. Like, nobody trusts that this money is real or is going to stay. That's why the teachers are still fighting to get it in contract. Don't fall for the smoke and mirrors, folks. They'll dangle the money in front of you just long enough to get your vote. Then they'll take it right away. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith, pictured here slightly overdressed for her trip to Tim Hortons, has a new plan to fix Alberta health care. It's just firing a bunch of people. Specifically, the Alberta Health Service has terminated the contracts of 126 AHS staff. They've been laid off and then offered jobs in different departments. This is part of a larger restructuring of healthcare within Alberta, but I don't know if you're aware of this, but firing people is not a great retention strategy. They've been given equivalent job offers, but it's worth noting that those job offers are not equivalent. So for starters, the hours are different and they're likely to receive about 200 hours less a year, but also a lot of them are gonna be red circled. That means they won't get any wage increases unless they're negotiated. And this is going to likely lead to a reduction in pay for all of those staff. So if you work for AHS and they want you to work in another department, it's distinctly possible that you get laid off, a pay cut and an hours reduction, and just get expected to apply for a new job. Seems like an excellent retention strategy. I mean, why would any healthcare worker want to work here? You just lose your job at a political whim. Who does this benefit? Who is this for? Why not just transfer them? It's yet another deliberate attempt to undermine healthcare. And they're attacking the front lines. Because you tell me, Alberta, you feel like you got 126 spare healthcare workers you could just lay off? Sure doesn't seem like it. Probably ask Danielle. Edmonton Mayor Amarjeet Sohi, pictured here explaining his plan to lower the bar, is lowering the bar, as the city of Edmonton continues to find limitless contempt for the unhoused population. This time it's very quietly and in a closed meeting ending funding for the Bissell Centre in downtown Edmonton. They've also cut funding to Boyle Street. Both of these are community spaces, day shelters, and offer a wide variety of supports for vulnerable populations. Yeah, their funding's just getting cut as Mayor Sohi just has decided that it's the province's responsibility. Like, he says, quote, it was never intended to be long-term sustainable support from the city because it's not the city's core responsibility. Oh, well then, it's just fine then. 
and it's incredibly disingenuous, literally last year. So he called these services, quote, very critical and advocated for this type of shelter. He also moved and voted to declare a homelessness emergency earlier this year. Such an emergency that he's cutting funding for supports. Seems like he's really taking it seriously. And they did it in secret. And it's the second time! Last month, they slashed funding to End Poverty Edmonton in a closed meeting. And this month, they're slashing even more funding. Again, private meeting. They insist it's perfectly fine because they were discussing confidential financial information. So just trust them, it's fine. But this makes it very clear, Edmonton doesn't actually care. They like to make it look like they care, they'll call press conferences and say lovely things. They'll talk about how seriously they take homelessness. And then they'll slash funding to supports. Because it's not about what they say, it's about what they do. And what they do makes it very clear that they don't care. Ontario Premier Doug Ford pictured here looking adorable in his tiny crown. Seriously, whoever the photographer is, aces. Anyways, Doug has a new and incredibly evil plan. Like, we're talking super villain level stuff here. As he intends to pave a lake. I am completely serious. As Global News has gotten their hands on internal emails around phase two of the Ontario Place redevelopment. They include a big entertainment complex, a marina, and paving a significant portion of Lake Ontario. How do you pave a lake? I don't know, Doug Ford will come up with something. But this is a huge problem. This whole thing has been secretive and hidden and behind closed doors. I mean, the public didn't even really know about a phase two. And it doesn't stop at phase two. They have big plans for Ontario Place. They don't involve you. They involve taking your money. And paving Lake Ontario. Doug Ford has officially lost his marbles. This man craves nothing but to rule you like a tiny little king. Don't let him. Conservative leader Pierre Poiliev pictured here snatching a fly right out of the air in the middle of a campaign speech. It was terrifying. Is in the news after even more ridiculous corruption. This time it has to do with one of his top advisors, Jenny Byrne. You may be familiar with Jenny Byrne because of her lobbying firm, Jenny Byrne & Associates, which does lobbying for companies like Loblaws. Well, she works for the Conservative Party. Of course, Jenny Byrne insists that she is not in charge of Jenny Byrne and Associates. They're just doing their own thing. Got nothing to do with Jenny Byrne. It's just Jenny Byrne and Associates. Focus on the Associates. But in reality, not only is she running a lobbying firm while working for the Conservatives, she's running two. The second firm does the exact same thing and has the same staff. It just got rid of the name Jenny Byrne. They literally opened it on the first day after Pierre Poiliev was elected conservative leader. They created a new organization called Four Check Strategies. Worth noting, if you tried to book an appointment on the Four Check Strategies website, it sent you to the booking system for Jenny Bird and Associates. Totally different companies, though. Of course, she insists that she has nothing to do with it, and that Four Check Strategies was established, quote, in order to avoid even the appearance of a conflict of interest. Yeah, that failed. Although my favorite here is when they insist that Byrne is not paid by Pierre Poiliev's office. When asked whether or not she's paid by the Conservative Party, they declined to answer. Shocking. They also declined to answer questions about whether or not they had consulted the lobbying commissioner before they started the firm. Of course not. Because one hand washes the other. This person asks why I don't just focus on my hometown, Regina. I mean, for starters, I do. But the reason's very simple, because I have a fairly large platform. So if I think something's important and worth sharing, I share it. That's not limited geographically. I tend to focus on Canada because that's what I know about, but I talk about municipal issues, provincial issues, and federal issues all across the country for two reasons. So I'll tell you why I pick stories to cover. I have a system. I ask myself two questions. Do I find the story interesting? Do I feel like I can contribute something? Offer some sort of insight? The answers to those two questions are yes, I cover it. Doesn't really matter where it happens. Because I'm not a journalist, I offer commentary and analysis. I break down the news. So if I find a story in Edmonton interesting and I can bring larger attention to it, I'm gonna do that. If you're more bothered by me talking about it than you are by Edmonton secretly slashing funding to shelters, you may have your priorities misaligned. This person's asking why I'm so hyper-focused on the West. Because I live there. I lived there my whole life. 
I talk about the places that I'm familiar with. Like, I don't talk about Quebec politics very often because Quebec politics is complicated. And I don't feel like I have a significant enough knowledge base to talk about it confidently. I've known about Saskatchewan, Alberta, and politics my whole life. Grew up out here. Been a politics nerd just as long. But I think it's important to note that when people don't like your message but have no actual response to it, they just try to undermine the message itself. Like, they don't like what I have to say, so they're going to try to dismiss it by saying, well, he's just hyper-focused on the West. So? What's your point? Stop trying to police who can take part in conversations. If I want to talk about what's happening in Edmonton, I'll talk about what's happening in Edmonton. Nobody is making you watch. Oh, bless. This will tell you about the default stance of a lot of conservatives on here. Never seen my videos before. Sees one criticizing Pierre Poiliev and says, Who are you and why don't I hear you go after Trudeau? I don't know, probably because you don't watch those videos? Like, imagine just discovering somebody's content, watching one two-minute video, and getting mad at them about the things they, they didn't talk about. Like, what? Like, if it doesn't directly attack Justin Trudeau, they have no interest in hearing it. Like, I feel like if you marketed a breakfast cereal called F. Trudeau that was just a box of broken glass and nails, it'd sell like hotcakes. They'd buy it by the bushel. They'd call them F. Trudeaus. Get it with the O's? Eh? This person is claiming that nobody wants me in Regina. And I have a question. Why do you say things like this? Why do people come into internet comment sections and say this? Like, it doesn't bother me. I'm not hurt. I just don't understand what possesses a human being to just go into a stranger's comment section and insult them. You don't know me. You don't know a thing about me. You've never met me. In my hometown, I'd actually like to believe I'm pretty well liked. So I'll ask you, friend. What do you base this opinion on? What factual information? And why did you feel the need to share it? Do you think this makes you the good guy? Do you feel better about yourself for having said this? Do you feel like people like you more? That you're somehow endearing yourself to your fellow people? Or do you think you're just loudly announcing your insecurities? That you've got all sorts of negative feelings tied up in yourself, so the only thing that you know how to do is lash out at other people. You good? Do you need a hug? Because you seem like you need a hug. Or maybe a new personality. This is the sort of comments that TikTok is fine with. Like, if I call somebody a jerk on here, I will get a content strike. But somebody actively advocating for me to self-harm? That's totally fine. Like, what do you think has to be going on inside someone's head for them to go into another person's comment section and suggest that they take their own life? That seems pretty bleak. Like, are you really that removed from the rest of humanity? That you see somebody that you disagree with? This is what you decide to say? Delete this app. Throw your phone in the ocean. Touch some grass. I love these posts. He spreads a lot of misinformation. Okay, be specific. Name it. What misinformation have I shared? I mean, on rare occasion I've had to issue a correction. But I make sure to research what I say. Before I make a claim, I verify it. And it's usually floating behind my head. So let's hear it, since you're making this allegation. Tell me of this misinformation I spread. Or is it factual information that challenges your existing worldview? Or is it perhaps factual information that makes you uncomfortable? That would force you to actually, I don't know, think. How dare I? How'd that get in there?